All right, hey, welcome RCC. I'm going to invite us to stand and sing this morning. We're going to sing of the great things that God is doing in our lives in this moment right now. Let's lift our voice. Let's sing together.
Amen, amen. Hey, well, welcome, church. Go ahead and have a seat. If you are joining with us online, we want to welcome you with us as well. Hey, if you're new with us, or even if you've been coming for a little while and you've yet to do so, there's a Connect card in the seat back in front of you. Go ahead and fill that out. We want to know you're here. There's crosses on either side of the room. You can also fill this out online. And we want to know that you're here worshiping with us this morning, but also on that same car, there's a place to request prayer. We are a praying church. We believe that there's power in prayer. We have a prayer team that meets in real time every single week and prays for us. They're praying for us right now, this, this service right now, over it. And we pray throughout the week, and we just believe that God moves and works on behalf of when his people come together and pray. And we want to be praying for you in this season. So fill that card out, write a prayer request, drop it in by the tables, by the crosses. You can fill it out online as well and we'll get those and we will be praying for you through this week. And then also church, we have an opportunity to give today and to give towards just all the incredible ministries and what God is doing here at RCC, the incredible outreach. It's just such an amazing place to be and that all comes through the provision of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but also through your generosity. And so if you've come prepared to give of an offering today, you can see on the screen there's several ways to do that. You can also give online and uh, it's just amazing to give towards what God is doing. So ways you can get plugged in there. Hey, we are gonna continue in worship. We're gonna turn into a time of communion. And then after that, we are gonna uh, continue singing together. I'm gonna invite Mr. Tim Queen and he's gonna come out and lead us in this time. Good morning, RCC. If you didn't get a, um, the elements, uh, the juice and the bread, as you walked in, just go ahead and raise your hand. There are people around here that will go ahead and bring them to you. So this morning as we uh, enter this time of communion, we wanna just reflect a few moments about uh, the church in RCC and maybe some of our origins here. And, you know, one of the things that strikes me as I look around this congregation, it reflects very much as it did eight years ago when there was a group of various different professions, landscapers, mechanics, accountants, and, and the like, that were all meeting together with a willing heart for Christ, but they all were flawed. None of them had, you know, a grand plan about how to plan, plan a church. They all had insecurities. They all had doubts, but they all were pursuing Christ. And so as we, as we think about what that looks like for each one of us, we probably, if we're honest, we all have insecurities, doubts, concerns about what the future may bring. But we should all be looking for identity and searching for identity in Christ to begin with. You see, God chooses to use flawed people because we can most readily relate to them. They're like us. Even if you're not willing to share what's going on with you, other people, as they share with you, you can see yourself, your own troubles through them. You can see that we're all common. We're all sinners. We all are in desperate need of a savior. We know that by God using flawed people like us, we have to focus on him. We need his grace. We need his ability to save us because we can't save ourselves. If you look at the Bible and you look at Moses leading the children of Israel out of, he wasn't a skilled leader, he wasn't a skilled speaker. He stuttered, he had doubts. God, why me? But that is where we get to see God's power, his sovereignty, his ability to use flawed people as he does throughout the Bible to do great things. Because it's not about what we do, but it's what he does through us that really shows the ability of God to really move in miracles in this world. So a great church can be looked at as being as a nice campus. It's got great programming. It's got all these wonderful things that are going. But most importantly, it's filled with flawed people seeking Christ. And just like Jesus did, Jesus stooped down to his disciples, washed their feet. He was a servant, a servant leader. And for all of us pursuing Christ, that's what we're called to be, regardless of our doubts, our insecurities, and our flawedness. So since we began this journey a number of years ago at RCC, that's been the heart of who we are, to be servants in the community, to be able to find our path like Christ did, and to serve others first and foremost. So if you feel flawed, unworthy, you don't know where your spot is, you're in good company. None of us know what we're doing. We're just trying to point to God be prayerful and reflect what he wants to have happen here on this earth. So this morning as you take your elements, reflect upon this. 
Think about where you're called to and recognize too that you are no less special than everyone else in this room or anyone that is pursuing Christ. Would you pray with me? Lord, this morning as we reflect upon your time on this earth and the sacrifice you gave, we remember, Lord, that you surround yourself with people like a zealot, a thief, fisherman, a tax collector. People in their own right were not worthy of the great commandment and taking this word out to the world in the four corners of the earth. But Lord, you used them and you showed your, your absolute power through them. So today, as we take these elements, remember the blood was sacrificed, your body that was broken. We remember the words we find in 2 Corinthians where it is, and it is in our weakness that through him, we are made strong. Amen.
Amen. Amen, church. Amen. Hey, stay standing, stay standing, because guess what? It's our birthday today, everybody. It's RCC's birthday. We turn eight today. How about it? Eight years old? So go ahead and hit it, Ty. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Give it up. Give it up. Happy birthday. Hey, say happy birthday to each other right now. Happy birthday to you. It's your birthday too. Happy birthday to all of us. Have a seat. Have a seat. My name is Nathan, one of the pastors here. I want to welcome you to RCC and welcome all of of those of you online right now. This is our eighth birthday. Everybody, we're in the second grade, all right? We're in the second grade. So... And I just think about what God's done in the last eight years, taking the people, like 40 people, 30 people that met for the first time eight years ago. And now we have at least 1,500 people that show up each and every week to worship together. Yeah, eight years and just amazing what God has done, isn't it? And I can't imagine what God is going to do next. So we're excited about this journey, this mission that we're on together, changing lives in, on behalf of Jesus Christ, all about what he is doing in our lives, as we heard Tim talk about during time of communion. And on top of that, we want to encourage you, if you're first time here, we want to say hi to you. We have a gift for you, so make sure you see us at the Welcome Center right after our service. We would love to say hi to you. And I want you to know this, many of us are heading out actually this week to Israel. That's right. A year ago, I was there by myself, but now I'm taking at least 40 of RCCers to Israel with me. And I can't wait for that to happen. And it's just going to be amazing. So we're going to have RCC in Israel. (laughs) So that's just mind blowing. And you never know, we might leave some magnets and bumper stickers there on people's cars, you know. So, so we're excited about that. So be praying for our trip. And if you're interested in that, watch us on Facebook. We'll be posting live on Facebook and photos. And you can kind of keep track with us. And if you're not on our group page, just go ahead and find us. And we'll put you in our group. So we're looking forward to, to that trip happening. So please be in prayer for us. And uh, we can't wait to walk where Jesus walked. Uh, right now in our relationship series, we're diving right into it. And today I want to talk about something I think that hits all of us. And uh, there was a, uh, a woman standing by herself at a bus stop in a dangerous part of town. And a police officer saw this and he goes up to her and he basically says, hey, do you want me to stand with you as you wait on your bus? And she just says, no, I'm fine. I'm all right. I don't need, you know, you'd be here. And then he kind of grinned and he got a little closer to her and he said, okay, would you mind standing with me? And I think that's the kind of the truth of all of us. In fact, they did a Gallup poll and it said, number, top six things that Americans are worried about are friends. Like, do I have good friends? And, and all of us want someone to stand by us, especially during the very difficult seasons of life. That, that makes sense because outside of family, the friends around us are the most important influence upon us. I would put it this way, the friends you choose will determine both the quality and the direction of your life, right? They'll determine the quality and direction of your life. I am where I'm at because of my friends, because God worked through my friendships. In fact, you've heard me say this, you show me your friends, I'll show you your future. That's kind of the same principle here. Show me your friends, I'll sh- and it'll tell me the quality and direction of your life. Proverbs writer said it this way. He said, he who walks with the wise, well, guess what? They grow what? Wise. But a companion of fools suffers what? Harm. And so I want to give you kind of a, a friend quiz. And I want you, even guys online, to take this friend quiz with me. And I'm going to ask a question. And you can write in your bulletin either one, you know, one, there's five of them, one, two, three, four, five. You can go ahead and say yes or no next to these questions, okay? So here's question number one. When you're going through a lousy period of time, when things are really sour in your life, do you have a friend you can call? Yes or no? 
Uh, that's a huge, right? Do you have someone that you can depend on at certain parts of your life? Do you have a friend, number two, who you let talk through a problem with? You know, they'll let you talk it out without giving you advice. They'll just kind of be a sounding board for you. Do you have someone you can just talk, just talk without them just giving you an answer? One person put it this way. Do you have a friend that knows you don't know what you're talking about, but they let you come to that conclusion on your own? <laughs> you have a friend like that? Yes or no? Number three, do you have a friend who will take the risk to tell you what, that you're making a bad decision? Do you have a friend that will tell you that you're using poor judgment? Do you have a friend like that? Yes or no? Number four, if you had a failure, do you know that your friend would stay with you? If you had a failure, do you have a friend that you know would stay with you? Yes or no? And finally, number five, do you have a friend you believe, you can trust, that you can share anything confidential with you can share that with anything that's confidential going on in your life, and it'll stay confidential. Like they're not going to tell someone else about what you told them. Do you have a safe place, a safe friend? And let me just tell you right now, if you can say yes to more, or most of those questions, or if not all those questions, you are extremely blessed and have so much to be grateful for, right? But if you, if you answered no, I guarantee you, you're looking for a friend like that. You're looking for friends like that in your life. Okay, so look at your neighbor right there, right now and tell them, go ahead and take good notes. Go ahead and tell your neighbor, take good notes. Go ahead. Because we're going to cover a lot of ground today. So I hope you, talk, you brought up, picked up two bulletins or something because there's a lot to write today. So today I want to talk to you about having friendships that the world will envy because we do friends, we do relationships the way Jesus taught us. Not in what's convenient for me, not what's easy for me, or not what I can get out of it. We do friends, relationships, God's way. C.S. Lewis, amazing author, said, is any pleasure on earth as great as a circle of Christian, what, friends by a fire? Is there anything better in life than that? And many of you know what that image looks like. The thesis, though, of today is this, that most, most friendships fail. Most friendships fail. Most friendships fail because of lack of commitment to those friendships. In other words, we don't put enough time and energy or effort or level of commitment for, for what those relationships should be. In fact, we can point to almost any success or any low time in life and see that a relationship was going on. Like when things were going really well, highlight of our life, there was probably a great relationship happening at that time. Like there was a sweet spot with the relationship. And then we look at low points of life, I guarantee you a lot of times it circles around a relationship, doesn't it? Because the low point of your life. So here's the thing, and it's so true, our goal is really simple, we want to raise a commitment level. I would say this, here's the goal, our goal is to raise a friendship commitment level from convenience to covenant. Most of us look at relationships as more convenience, but we want to go from, we want to go to a commitment that's real. We want to do, go to a commitment that is deep. Friendships are important to all of us. I don't care if you're a child in the room. I don't care if you're in high school or in college. I, I don't care if, if you're a young family or maybe you're chronically challenged like many of us in the room. It doesn't matter what season of life. I was talking uh, on the phone with somebody recently, and they asked me, you know, what's your favorite, what's your favorite band? And I just went ahead and said, oh, Def Leppard. I just kind of brought it up. And they're like, ooh, classic. That's classic. And I was like, that sounds old is what you make that sound like. It sounds so, <laughs> makes me sound so old. So, so it doesn't matter what season of life you're, or you're in. We all need to listen to this. And so when I launched into ministry a number of years ago, I, I realized something um, and, and as I started with this full-time ministry for the first time. That was uh, people, I don't know if you know this, but people are high maintenance. I don't know if you know that. This church I was working with, it was kind of good news, bad news. Good news is that they were all going to heaven. <laughs> That's awesome. The bad news is that they weren't going soon enough. You know what I'm saying? Like it just... <laughs> Move this along a little bit, right? Because they were high maintenance people. And, and so as I'm talking about friendship, some of you are thinking right now, I don't want to really be friends with most people because they're crazy. And so, so, so here's what I want to do right now. I want to kind of give you categories. And if you know someone in each one of these categories, I want you to raise your hands, kind of audience participation. I'm like that. I get bored easy. So let's kind of go back and forth a little bit. I, I, if I say something, you know someone, you know, it fits in this, this category, raise your hand, all right? Number one is this, the critic. You know the critic constantly complains, gives unwanted advice. Anybody knows a critic? It's like they get paid to be critical. You know what I'm saying? You know anybody like that? 
All right, how about this one? Uh, how about the martyr? Forever the victim, racked with self-pity. Anybody know a martyr? You have no idea the trouble I'm going through. You have no idea. You can't relate, right? Like, like they're the only ones. How about this? The wet blanket. Pessimistic and automatically negative. Anybody know anybody the wet blanket? All right, they're, just, they're in heaven, the streets of gold. They, they see the dust on the streets of gold. Like, they're just picking it off. Like, can't believe this place. I'll be nicer than this. How about the steamroller? Blindly insensitive to others, like a bull in a china shop, right? They kind of run you over. Anybody know anybody like that, right? They run you over. They say something, blast you out of the water. You're reeling from it. You go back and talk to them like, oh, you're still hung up on that? That was like 10 minutes ago. Like, I've moved on. All right, that's the steamroller, all right? How about the gossip? Spreads rumors and leaks secrets. Anybody know a gossip in their life? Anybody? You know, I don't need to describe this one. How about the control freak, Unla unable to let go and let be? Anybody know anybody like that? All right. How about the backstabber, irrepressibly two-faced? Anybody know anyone that's a backstabber? Okay. How about the cold shoulder, disengages and avoids contact? They're really hard to connect with, all right? Kind of always blowing you off, okay? How about this, a green-eyed monster seized with envy? Anybody know anybody that's really envious, always comparing themselves to others? I know you know this one, the volcano, build steam and ready to erupt. You don't know what to say, what to do. You don't want to set them off. Anybody know a volcano? How about the sponge? Anybody know a sponge constantly in need and gives nothing back? Very, very needy. Oh, yeah. Don't point. Don't point. <laughs> They're sitting over there. All right. How about this? The competitor always keeping score of everything, you know? I caught a fish this, oh, really, my fish was this big. You know, they're always one-upping you, you know? So, so I, I know what's probably going on as I go through this list of high-maintenance people. Faces are coming to your mind, aren't they? Faces are coming to your mind. Now, how many of you are basically know someone in each one of those categories? Raise your hand if you know someone, probably each one of those categories, okay? Now, let, let me just see this. Aren't you delighted, though? Aren't you delighted that you're not like that? I mean, this message is for the people in the other services, not for the second service and third service, right? Aren't you glad that no one would ever think of you? How are you doing? I mean, if you don't think you fall in one of those categories, you don't need this sermon. You need therapy is what you need. I'm like two or three of those, okay? I'm just going to be honest with you. People are going, that's Nathan. Oh, there's Nathan again. I mean, one of the... One of my favorite relationship stories out there is about a guy in a hot air balloon. He's in, he's in Arizona. Many people watch on Arizona every day. He's in Arizona. We have hot air balloons in Arizona oftentimes. And, and all of a sudden, he's out there, and he's lost, and he's got to figure out where he's at because he needs to make an appointment. And so he starts lowering his altitude in the hot air balloon, and he sees a hiker on the side of a kind of a mountain. And he, and he starts talking to her, and he says, hey, uh, excuse me, can you help me? I promised I would meet a friend in, in an hour, and I don't know where I'm at. And the hiker looks up and says, well, um, you are in a hot air balloon hovering approximately like 30 feet above the ground, and you're between 40 to 41 degrees north latitude and between 59 to 60 degrees west longitude. <laughs> and the guy in the hot air balloon says, um, you must be an engineer. And the hiker says, uh, well, yes, yes, I am. How did you know? And the, the guy in the balloon says, well, because everything you told me is technically correct, but I have no idea what to do with your information. And the fact is, I'm still lost. Frankly, you're, you're not much help to me after all so far. So if anything, you've actually delayed my trip. And the person hiking looks at the balloonist and says, you must be in management. And the man in the hot air looks down and says, uh, well, why, yes, I am. How'd you know? And she says, well, you don't know where you are. You don't know where you're going. You have risen to where you are due to a large quantity of hot air. That's good right there. Anyway, you made a promise which you have no idea how to keep, and you expect me to solve your problem. The fact is, you are in exactly the same position you were before we met, but now somehow it's my fault. And we all know people like this, like somehow, like what's going on in their life is somehow your fault, right? And I tell you, in a highly dysfunctional culture we live in, there are hurting people all around us, right? And hurting people hurt people. 
And it's almost like everyone's got an infection on their hand and they're just so scared to interact with other people because they don't want to get that spot hurt. You know, you ever hit that infection spot, you kind of recoil back. And we all like that right now in our relationships. We don't know like how close to get. We're kind of really skittish about it. We're like cats dancing around one another, waiting to get offended at any moment because of our wounds. And I want to tell you right now, what happens is our relationships are getting dumbed down is what's happening. And we say, well, if I wasn't treated right, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get much commitment in this relationship. And we see that even in churches. Like people are like, you know, I'm just gonna take my ball and go play somewhere else because they hurt my feelings. Like people are just not really committed because they're so wounded. Our relationships are not very deep and they're very shallow. And there's just a tendency to base our relationships on convenience rather than commitment or even covenant. And in your notes, I have three levels of friendships I want to talk about with you as we start. Number one is this, surface friendships. And that's exactly what this sounds. I mean, that's what they are, surface friendships. You see them around town. You kind of look at them and go, hey, how you doing, man? Let's get together sometime. When I moved back to the South, I told Rachel, I'm like, man, this is kind of cool, man. People want to get together everywhere I go. Hey, let's get together. Let's get together. Let's get together. Let's get together. And I figured out after being here a few more months, I had to be reminded what that means. That means absolutely nothing is what that means. You want to trip somebody up and they say, let's get together. Here's what you do. You ask them a question. When? And they're like, I didn't mean like that. I mean, I just, <laughs> I just meant let's get together. Shallow surface relationships. That's how many of us have in our friendships, right? Number two, structured friendships. These are relationships that we encounter continually, maybe at work, maybe a kid's ball game. There's a reason, there's a function that brings us together. Like, there's not really... Um, there's not really much substance to the friendship. It's mainly about that function, if that makes sense, right? So there's like structured friendships. And then lastly, this is what we're going after, solid, secure friendships. This is a commitment relationship based on and built on unconditional love. It's, it's built on a biblical standard of commitment. It's built on the standard of Jesus Christ. It's not about convenience, it's not, well, we'll see if this works and we'll be friends as long as I'm, you know, it's easy for me. It's not like that. I never forget a professor in college. He said, you'll be blessed if you go through life with three close friends. I was like, that's cynical. I started looking at all my friends I had and then life went on. And I started realizing when it wasn't easy, when it wasn't convenient, all of a sudden friendships started drifting away. And then when things got messy, then you start really figuring out who your friends are, right? And in times got messy, there was those few friends that stuck by me, either something bad happened to me or things I caused on myself. And people st stayed with me and were loyal to me and, and, and encouraged me. They called me out, but they loved me unconditionally. And I thought to myself, how do I deserve friendships like this? Right? I mean... You've had a friendship like that where friendship gets to the place where it moves you, where you know how easy it had been for them to bail. You know how easy it would have been for them just to leave you, and it was so inconvenient for them to stay in relationship with you, but that relationship was realized because it was deep commitment. They say, I will never leave you. I will stay with you through this process. I had a friend, mentor of mine, he's probably listening right now online, and he said these words. He said, Nathan, you know how you find out if someone's a true friend? I said, uh, no, I don't know how you find that out. I probably gave him an answer, and his answer was this. He says, you'll find out who your true friends are when it's inconvenient. When it's inconvenient, you'll find out who your true friends are. And the Bible talks about friendships like this. One is this, few friends are true friends, what the Bible says. Few friends are true friends. Proverbs says this, friends come and friends go, but a true friend sticks by you, read it with me, like family. Friends love through what? All kinds, good weather, bad weather, all kinds of weather. Why is this? Because a real friend maintains loyalty. You want to know who your friends are? Just make a mistake. Make a mistake, and you'll find out who your real friends are. A real friend checks in when other people check out. 
A loyal friend maintains a consistent defense before others on behalf of you. They take up for you and others take away from you. Whether you are with them or not, they will stand up for you. A loyal friend has a genuine spirit of rejoicing with your accomplishments. The Bible says we rejoice with those rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Let me be honest with you. I think it's easier to grieve with people who are grieving than rejoice with those who are rejoicing because then we start going, well, I didn't have that happen to me. And it's hard sometimes to rejoice over a friend's victories, but true friends will do that. They'll rejoice when you are rejoicing. Number two, friends will speak truth to you. Friends will speak true to you. There's friends that will come into your life that love you so much that they'll be truthful. They will wrap that truth in love and in care, but they make it work because they're honest with you. Scripture says the wounds from a friend are worth it, but kisses from an enemy, what, will do you in. One way of putting is a loyal friend is someone who's tactfully honest with you. (laughs) Tactfully honest, they speak truth and love. Real friends will tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Enemies will tell you what you want to hear, but not what you need to hear. See, when real friends see a friend getting ready to wreck their life, real friends tell them they don't withhold. And this is really personal with me because I'm not standing before you right now without some friends who intervened in my life at a crucial point when I was about to go off a cliff. And thank God that I had friends who liked, loved me enough that it wasn't about being liked, that they stood in the gap and they said, Freeman, you're not doing this anymore. You're not going any further with this, with this relationship. And I'm so grateful that they saved me from even my own, my own decisions. But we hopefully you can do it tactfully sometimes. Sometimes it's gotta get, you know, more raw than that. But tactful is a great way. Someone said that tact is the ability to make a point without making an enemy. <laughs> Man, when you got someone like this in your life that will stand the gap for you and you're about to go off the cliff, keep them close because here's the deal. Here's the deal. Let's just be honest. You ain't that much. And your friends know that about you. And they will not flatter you. The world will try to flatter you to your face and then criticize you behind your back. A true friend will confront you to the face, to your face, but always, they will always have your back. Number three, friends refresh us. A sweet friendship refreshes the soul. Isn't that true? Man, I, I could sum up friendships and relationships in a very simple way. You're, you are in a friendship right now. You're either a plus to someone or you're a minus to someone. Another way of saying it is either adding value or lifting them up, taking them to a higher place, or you're pulling them down or you're subtracting right now. I'm either making deposits in my friendships or I'm making withdrawals in my friendships. People are minuses. You know, you kind of walk, you see them walk in the room. And you just kind of feel like they already drain you, right? The closer they get, you can feel, feel life being sucked out of your body, right? You're like, oh, no, here they come. And there's other people, they walk in the room, you can't hardly wait, right? You can't wait because they give you energy. They uplift you. They add value. They're a plus. You see them calling. You get excited. You can be right in the middle of a meeting. You're like, I got to take this call because <laughs> they'll encourage you. And some of you who looked at your phone before and you've thought this question, I don't think I'm available right now, am I? And why are you like that? Because they're pulling energy out of you. There are people in your life that are minuses, and I don't think they do that intentionally. I don't think they wake up in the morning and go, man, I can't wait to suck the life out of people today. I don't think that's their purpose. But we're honest. Let's be honest about it. I'm going to put myself in there. We're selfish. We're selfish, and a person is so focused on themselves, and what they do is slowly chipping away at a relationship, and they're sucking the life out of even the people around them, like their friends. I know this. If you're going to make a commitment to a friendship, you're going to have to be intentional about being a plus and pouring into them, because it's so natural to be selfish, and all about me, and what can I get? Instead of, what can I do for you? How can I lift you up? What's better for you? Let's go that route. And the fourth thing the Bible talks about is this, friends sharpen one another. That means we make each other better. Proverbs says this, you use steel to sharpen steel, right? And one friend, guess what? Sharpens another. Now, as we look at these four things that the Bible says, I got a question for you. We look at committed friendships, stick together, 
They speak truth in love. They refresh each other. They sharpen one another. How many of you would like someone in your life like that, a walk in your life that refreshes you, sharpens you, makes you better, unconditionally loves you, has got your back? How many of you want a friend like that? Raise your hand if you want a friend like that. Raise your hand. By the way, this is not a relational question. This is an IQ question. If your hand's not in the air, you've got problems. We all want a friend like that. But here's the truth. Listen, we attract who we are. We attract who we are, not what we want. The people we attract are the kind of people that we are. I know people in my life are so insecure, and it's amazing. You can put them in a room with people they don't know, 100 people they don't know, and they will find the next most insecure person in the room within an hour. You magnetize people who are like you. I talk to pastors all the time. I was in Destin, Florida last week, and, and the question was, what kind of people do you want on your staff? And us pastors make all kinds of lists. I want a people who sold, I want a person on my staff who sold out for Jesus. I want someone who's got a great work ethic, good team player, integrity, right? Good attitude. And pastors come up with all these wonderful lists, but the question you have to ask is, is that you? Is that you? Because if it's you, you will attract people like that. Because we attract who we are, not what we want. Same thing if you're looking to marry. What do you want? I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. Well, be that person right? We attract who we are. So what does a real friend look like? Number one, be the right person. We need to be the right person. It doesn't matter by fixing someone else or getting them to raise their commitment level. We need to be like Jesus. We need to be committed to them first. Who we are deter determines how we see people. If we have to be the right people around us, that means that I'll be committed to you no matter what. But it doesn't start with my friend, it starts right here with me. I need to commit unconditionally to them. I need to be an unselfish friend who's not using you, but actually looking out for your best interest ahead of my own, Philippians chapter two. Also, that means that I don't become possessive. <laughs> and some of us need to hear this. Some friends feel like they have to have full knowledge of our whereabouts and what we're doing and who we're hanging out with and why they weren't invited. A good friend is secure enough to permit a healthy amount of independence. The second thing committed friendships is, is this, and that is committing time, committing energy. We need to commit time. It's just not given. This kind of friendship takes time and energy. I love what John Maxwell said. He called it the gardening principle. He said, all relationships need cultivation. And that's a fact. All relationships, friendships, all relationships need cultivation. And the opposite of this is also true. Where a man and a woman are married and they're not really pouring into the marriage. And you got this guy, he's, he's at a counselor with his wife. And, and she's just kind of railing on him because he's not giving enough in the marriage. And, and he just looks at her and he says, honey, I told you I loved you on my wedding day. Right? And if I change my mind, I'll let you know. That's not what we're talking about here. That's the opposite. All relationships take time and energy, right? And you know the difference. You know, many of us have been dating and then we married. You know, there's a difference between dating and marriage. And dating is all about them, right? It's all about what they want and how can I win you over. And you pour time and energy into it. And you get the chair. You open the door. And you make them happy. And you serve them. And you get married. It gets a little different, doesn't it? Reminds me of the couple who's dating and, and she goes to her, her boyfriend and a person she's engaged to, and she says, you know, can you, can you go by? She texts him, can you go by the dry cleaners? I left something there. Can you pick something up for me? And he's like, oh, absolutely. I'd be delighted to. I would love to. I'll drive all the way across northeast Florida, you know, to go to dry cleaners and get that for you on my lunch break and then come all the way back to you. That would be an honor. I just love you so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they get married, right? Married, same thing. Hey, can you go across town? I forgot something, the dry cleaners. And the marriage couple's going, what's wrong with your memory? You got to write this stuff down. You got a broke leg. Why can't you do it, right? I mean, all of a sudden, it gets a little different, doesn't it? 
And that's what happens, man. Marriages disintegrate, relationships, friendships disintegrate when we don't pour time and energy into them. Friendship is a choice, a choice to give time, a choice to give energy. So let me wrap up this message by telling you, I think this is not in your notes, it's not even on the screen, but I just want you to hear me out as we close about friendship, because this is huge. And I think God wants you to hear this. Two desires from God about friendships. A big part of time and energy is real friendship is going to take this. It's going to take, wait for it, forgiveness. It's going to take forgiveness. If you're going to have a friendship that's going to last a significant amount of time, you're going to have to learn to forgive. Because guess what? Newsflash, they're not perfect. And bigger newsflash, neither are you. Neither are you. This is good right here. Proverbs 17, 9 says, whoever should foster love covers over an offense. They cover it over an offense, but whoever repeats the matter, guess what happens? Separates. Separates what? Close friends. Some of you in this room have a former, former close friend. And the thing that's kept you apart is you both or you or them has refused to forgive. And there's a wedge right now going on. And can I just tell you that life is too short to hold grudges against friends? It's too short. You need to make that right. Your anger gets you in trouble. But guess what? Your pride keeps you there. Your pride will keep you separated from your friend. And some of you need to text right now someone while I'm preaching. You're listening to this online right now. You need to text someone and say, you know what? Can we talk later today or can we talk tomorrow? You didn't make things right with them. And just say, you know what? I love you too much for this relationship to stay where it's at right now. And I just want you to know is that I forgive you or maybe you need to ask for forgiveness and just say, you know what? You mean too much to me. You pour too much into me. I pour too much into you just to let this just go and us be separate the rest of our lives. We need to come back together. And I want you to know that my heart is for you and I want to make this right. What can I do to make this right? Let's agree without being so disagreeable. Here's the truth. You don't have to see eye to eye to walk hand in hand with a friend. And some of us think we have to. No, you don't have to see eye to eye to walk hand in hand with a friend. In 1471, there was two aspiring German artists that entered art school together. And, uh, and, and, and they were back in the 1400s. This is widespread poverty. Two names, two guys, Hans and Albright. They went to art school together, realized it was just too expensive for both of them. So Hans realized that Albright was a better artist. And so what he decided to do was to do manual labor for his friend Albright. So his friend Albright could continue to go to, to school. And so his friend was in school and Hans was out there working manual labor. And eventually Albright became successful and became a successful painter. And then he thought, you know, I'll return the favor and I'll pour into Hans so he can go back to school and then he can be an artist. But by the time Hans went into school and started learning how to paint correctly, his hands had become so callous, so rough, had become so swollen from all those years of doing manual labor for his friend Albright. Albright wanted to do something to thank Hans for his sacrifice. And he went to see Hans one day and he found Hans praying for him. He found Hans, his friend, praying for Albright. And he was folded, his hands were folded kind of like this. And when Albright saw Hans' his friend's hands like this, he thought to himself, that's it. <laughs> that's it. And there's a good chance You've seen what Albright did to honor his friend Hans. The famous portrait of the praying hands. These are the hands of Hans that were painted. It's a tribute, listen, to one friend who sacrificed so another friend could flourish. And I'm going to tell you this, for friendship to happen, it's going to take forgiveness and it's going to take sacrifice so that our friends can flourish. And I think it's similar to Jesus' hands. Family, what a friend we have in Jesus, amen? Jesus is truly a friend who will stick closer to you than a brother or a sister. He is loyal. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is unselfish. Jesus said this about friendship. He said, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's what? Friends. 
Jesus is a sacrificial friend. He's a loyal friend. And he is a forgiving friend. Praise God. Jesus took our skins, sin, though, as scarlet, and through his sacrifice on the cross, he has made us white as snow. He has separated our sins as far as the east is from the west. And the real relationship that defines your life is a friendship. And that friendship is with Jesus Christ. And I want to give you an opportunity to make that right right now, to receive Jesus as your best friend as your Lord, and as your Savior. If you haven't done that, you need to make that move right now. Will you stand with me? We're going to pray right now together, and I just want to have a moment of prayer. Some of us need to celebrate our friendship. We need to just praise God. God has been so good to us. He's given us incredible friends, and we just need to praise Him for that during this time of prayer. And you can come up here. Our prayer team is up here. They would love to pray with you and just celebrate that with you. Maybe today... You didn't make things right with a friend. And I've had that moment in my life. Well, I've had people pray for me as I get ready to go into conversation because things have gotten so kind of dark and cold and distant with someone. And it was time for me to come out and just come out to light and just say, man, I need to talk to you about what's on my heart and just tell you what's happening in our friendship and why I'm so distant from you. Maybe you need prayer about that. I needed prayer. Our team's up here, love to pray with you. Maybe today you need to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can come up and do that right now. Let me pray over you right now. Father God, we are so grateful for the friend we have in Jesus Christ. And Lord, through Jesus, we see what it looks like. We know what it looks like to be a good friend and to have a good friend. And Lord, help us to not be so focused on how other people treat us, but Lord, may we be people who step up and are the right person, the right friends for other people. Lord, we can't control our friends, but we can control ourselves. And may we be people who are sacrificial and loyal and forgiving towards others. Lord, I pray right now for friendships that are struggling right now. And Lord, may you you rain down forgiveness on us and through us so that friendship can be reconciled. Lord, we praise you for friendships that are going well, for people who are with us when good times happen and when bad times happen, just like Jesus, Lord, we praise you for that. And some of us in this room, we need to make the most important relationship right, the relationship that defines our life right here and for all eternity. And that relationship is a friendship with Jesus. And Lord, many of us, some of us in this room and listening online, need right now to move towards you through Jesus, accepting that grace that he offers us and saying that my best friend is actually my Lord and he is my Savior. Lord, I pray for wherever we're at right now that we'll make a move, either celebration, reconciliation, or finally being redeemed through the blood of Jesus. So, Lord, we can have flourishing relationships and friendships in our life. And may you get all praise and glory for it. We pray this all in the name of your son, Jesus. The whole church said, amen. Can we give God the praise right now for being the incredible friend to us? He's the best friend you'll ever have. Let's worship him right now. If we can be blessed and come forward as we worship the King of Kings.
as truth over our lives, over this morning, over our season and circumstance. Let's sing this out. And there has never been, there will never be, a God like you, a love so true. There has never been, there will never be, God like you love so encourage you we're excited because this week guess what's happening on friday night we have worship night who's excited about worship night happening this friday night seven o'clock invite your friends and family it's going to be amazing you don't want to miss it and on top of that we have easter egg hunt happening on april 2nd easter's coming down the pipeline so we would love to have your help spreading the word about that and can we give god the praise all that he's done for the last eight years our eighth birthday church let's give him glory man let's give him praise all that he's going to do I can't wait to win more people to Jesus with you, all right? So let's go change the world. Love you guys. See you soon. God bless.